Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, a warm welcome to IIM Bangalore and for this evening's panel discussion. I am Vasanti Srinivasan, Chair of the Center for Corporate Governance and Citizenship, and it's my pleasure this evening to host the panel discussion from the Center. Uh, I take no more than a couple of minutes to just introduce the Center that many of you may not be aware of. The Center is a part of the Institute, and uh, the Center was started in 2003 as a center for excellence by the National Foundation of Corporate Governance to be able to look at, at that point in time, the emerging idea on governance. So our work really was around board, and a lot of our research has been around board interlocks, contribution of independent directors. Over the last three, four years, we've had, uh, the center is actually the Center for Corporate Governance and Citizenship, and as the environment and the focus is shifting to looking at fundamental questions around ethics, more importantly, responsibility of businesses, this, the center's own activities have gradually spread into multiple other areas. At this point in time, as I speak to you, there are three broad areas that the center is engaged with. The first in the field of management education, where there is a lot of work that we do with business schools across the country in promoting the teaching of ethics, governance, corporate responsibility, environment and sustainability. Uh, we do research in those areas. And the second area that we do is niche training workshops for industry associations when they request asking for some inputs for their members on any of these areas. And three, third, the most important one is research. And currently, we have two research uh, projects uh, going on. And one of them is really around the, what is the state of corporate governance ethics teaching in the country? And the second one is on board interlocks. What's really happening on our boards? Well, on one hand, there's a lot of regulation that is coming into play. Do these regulations in the last two decades, have they in any way really impacted uh, in terms of corporate governance practices? Okay. So, a uh, pleasure to have you all here. And I'm now going to hand over to uh, uh, Professor Rishikesha Krishnan, one of the advisory members of the uh, uh, committee for the Center for Corporate Governance and Citizenship. Over to you, Rishi. <laughs> Thank you, uh, Vasanti. Good evening. Uh, let me just give you a little bit of background about why we are holding uh, this panel here this evening. And then I introduce you to the panelists and then we'll start uh, with the panel itself. Uh, the Center for Corporate Governance and Citizenship has been actively involved in looking at issues related to ethics and governance. And as part of playing a bigger role in public debate on these issues, we started holding a series of talks by many people from the public sphere. So uh, some months ago we had a panel, not a panel, actually, uh, an interaction with Justice Santosh Tekke, the former Lokayuk, at that time he was still the Lokayuk of Karnataka. And that gave an opportunity for college students and professionals in Bangalore to have an open interaction with him about several of their concerns regarding corruption and how it can be controlled. A few months later, we had another event with uh, Mr. Bakchi from Mindtree. And um, uh, he spoke about his own efforts in building his company and what role ethics and corporate governance has played in that. And this is the third event in that series where we want to talk about some of the larger issues that are currently uh, a great concern to the country. Now given the backdrop where you know, there are several things happening as we speak today, there have been uh, some hardening of positions on the Lokai bill and it looks like there's going to be a fairly long drawn conflict before anything uh, gets legislated. Uh, there is a lot that we as individual citizens and professionals have to think about regarding what is our role in creating a better environment for good governance in the country. And uh, we thought there could be no better way of reflecting on this other than calling a group of people who have thought very deeply about this issue, either in a scholarly way or from a corporate uh, context or from the media, and try to look a little more seriously at why are we seeing so much emphasis and so much concern about issues of ethics uh, in India today. When we, uh, Vasanti and I were discussing uh, this panel, 
we realized that the last year has really been a watershed year in India's history. For the first time, we have seen such a large number of people from the political and senior bureaucratic establishment spending long periods of time in jail, uh, accused of various offenses related to corruption. Even more uh, agonizing has been the fact that several iconic business leaders who were known for setting up either very well-known businesses or in the case of some of them even as professionals leading some of the top organizations in the world have again been on the mat for various ethical transgressions. Given this uh, context where we are seeing so many of these events being reported in just the last year or two, this certainly raises concerns about what, what's really happening here. Is it that India is a particularly unethical and corrupt place. Is it something to do with our society and our culture? Or is it just that this is a cumulative effect of many years of regulation and control? Or are some of the things we are seeing, particularly in the business sphere, just the outcome of rampant uh, capitalism or capitalism kind of running wild? So there's so many different questions which are coming up. And we thought we would therefore have this panel this evening to have a intellectual and a more deep debate on some of these issues. So let me just welcome the uh, four panelists we have this evening, one by one, and also request them to come and join us uh, on the uh, desk. Uh, our first panelist is Professor Samuel Paul. Professor Paul, you please come. Uh, Professor Samuel Paul uh, has been a distinguished economist, uh, he was a former director of the Indian Institute of Management at Ahmedabad. After his long stint at Ahmedabad, he spent several years working with the World Bank. And when he returned to India, he took up a very important mission of trying to improve the standard and quality of public services by focusing on what kind of public services are being offered to citizens and measuring public perception of these services through a report card mechanism. So the organization he set up, the Public Affairs Center here in Bangalore, has done excellent work in trying to put the spotlight on these issues. When I was uh, looking at uh, Professor Paul's work, I also realized that the book he co-edited on corruption in India, which is a classic, has now been around for about almost 20 years, I think. It's one of the earliest studies looking at the problems of corruption in India. And we're very happy to have you this evening, sir, with us. Thank you. Our second uh, panelist is Professor Deepankar Gupta. Professor Deepankar Gupta is one of uh, India's foremost sociologists. Uh, he recently formally retired from the Jawaharlal Nehru University, but he certainly hasn't retired from scholarly thought and reflection on a number of the sociological issues uh, confronting India. Uh, I first got acquainted with uh, Professor Deepankar Gupta's work when I was doing some preparation for my ethics class several years ago. He was closely involved with KPMG in setting up their uh, ethics and governance practice in India. And uh, I think partly as an outcome of that, he also wrote a book called Ethics Incorporated, which looked at several of the ethical concerns faced particularly in the business context. So he's actually spanned you know, the whole spectrum in a sense. And as a sociologist, he's looked at so the society as a whole. But then in his interaction with KPMG and the corporate sector, He's also looked more closely at ethics and governance issues in the corporate context. So we are delighted to have you with us this evening, Professor Gupta. Uh, our third panelist is Mr. Paranjay Uvathakurta. Paranjay, please. Uh, Paranjay is a very senior journalist. Uh, he has over uh, 34 years of experience in the radio, television, and the print media. Uh, he has being one of the rare journalists who has spent quite a lot of his time focused both on training and on ethical issues related to the media and his profession. So in recent years, he has uh, taken it upon himself to spend a lot of effort trying to bring these issues to the uh, public attention. One of the things he did in this direction was to bring out a video called Blood and Iron which was one of the first big efforts to expose these scams connected to iron ore mining in Karnataka. 
More recently, he, has, he was part of the press council's inquiry team, which looked at the whole issue of paid news. And in that context, he was the co-author of the news, which sorry, the report which exposed several of the senior dimensions of this whole phenomenon of paid news. He lectures in several of the leading institutes in India, including the University of Delhi, IIM Ahmedabad, and so on. And we are again very happy to have him with us. And finally, we have um, Meena Ganesh. Meena, this is her. Meena is the CEO and Managing Director of Pearson Education Services. Uh, she has been a leader both in startups as well as in the corporate sector. She was earlier the CEO of Tesco's uh, Indian branch. She was also the co-founder of Customer Asset. And she spent the earlier part of her career with Microsoft, PwC, and NIIT. So we're very uh, delighted to have a distinguished corporate leader like Nina with us this evening. And because we honestly very firmly believe that it's very important for the corporate sector and business leaders to take as much of a leadership position in addressing these issues as it is for everyone else from academia and the media and so on. So we're delighted to have you with us today. Thank you. So, what I will now do is I will request each one of our speakers to speak for about uh, 8 to 10 minutes to give their perspective. And then we will have maybe one round of some interaction between them. If I, I maybe I'll ask them a few questions. And then we'll open it up for participation by the audience. So that will be the format. Uh, may I request uh, Professor Paul, can you please start? So welcome. I'm delighted to share this presentation with other panelists who are present. Friends, I, when I was invited, I wondered what one should say in opening remarks at a get together of this kind. I didn't really know who the audience was at that time. I understand the students as well as practicing managers are present. The subject is such that one can spend a long time going into the multiple facets of the issues involved, and we don't have the time for that. So I will not, I almost like bullet points, just present a few thoughts which I hope will stimulate you to ask questions or to think about the issues that we are going to consider this evening. Let me start by saying, since the focus is on ethics, or the ethical Indian, that two things need to happen in order for ethical conduct to take place, whether it is in a corporate setting, civil society, or in public life, or in the functioning of the state. First of all, we need individuals who hold certain values as precious to them, who have been brought up in traditions that sustain them in relating to those values, practicing them, while at the same time being nurtured by institutions around us, society at large, and so forth. We need both these. And I did, when we discuss this in detail, you will see it is really the inability of these two things to come together that results in unethical practices, corruption, low standards in public and private life, and so forth. So in a way, we are talking about something very personal. Finally, decisions that we take on many issues, not necessarily in government, but in our own decisions about building a home, getting a clearance on this. The things that we decide, whether to pay a bribe, or to do this or that, are highly personal. That's why I'm emphasizing the individual and his values is very critical in enabling us to stand up for what we think is morally right and appropriate. Both corporate, the corporate world as well as our state, the public institutions, reflect the weaknesses in these two things that I mentioned. Everything that you see that you would 
referred to as abuses of public power, corporate power, whether it involves money, transactions in terms of bribes or other abuses, can be attributed to the weaknesses that I indicated uh, earlier. You would ask why? I have to say that after studying this issue and also living through all this in India as well as other countries observing what goes on in the world, I have concluded that in our country a major problem is that we do have a, some kind of a tolerance for corruption in our society compared to some other societies I have seen. It could be the weakness in our home, in many families are having parents, not educated, they don't have the background in which other people here, for example, many of us have been brought up. There are institutions around them in society which have not nurtured the kind of values that we would all like everyone to have. For whatever reason, moral standards uh, are somewhat loose or elastic in our society. You may debate it, we may attribute it to colonial, actually it goes much earlier than that. We need not we can have, have a big discussion just on that. Just to give an example, in your note you mentioned Kiran Bailey's statement that she thought because she is using the money that she saves for a good cause, that justifies it. She came out openly. She probably believed in that. That's exactly the philosophy of all people who go to Tirupati or all the generals, right? You make a crown of jewels and diamonds, and if we put it there, then our sins of corruption and abuses are almost. What's the difference between Karan Bedi and the others? That's what I'm say, why I'm saying there is this kind of perception of general belief if these things are all okay, we can justify this way, that way, then we live with that. I have seen in other societies people who wouldn't buy that. There are many who would stand up and say, no, this I would not do. You may say, maybe they are rich, so they can withstand the consequences. There could be various explanations, but I am saying societies are not all alike in this. And we as Indians, we should be concerned, how do we make this less elastic? How can we all share in similar values and sort of stand up and hold on to that. that. This I see as a major problem in the phenomenon that we are discussing. One way in which this could have been strengthened is that we had regard for the rule of law. When I mentioned public institutions, that's what I had in mind. If public institutions and the laws they are supposed to implement or enforce, if that takes the place of pushing you to hold on to your values, then you would have done better. Because even if you didn't believe in something, somebody is forcing you to take you to task, you would think twice. That isn't happening. We have many laws being passed. Actually, we have more laws than we really need. And what is happening now with Lokpal is also the same. We think one more law, one more act passed in the parliament will solve it. And how to make it complicated, perfect, that's what we are after. Actually, I think it's the other way. Even if you have fewer laws, if you are able to implement them well, it would have given a message to the elastic sense that people have about moral standards, values, etc., or ethical conduct. I think we have weak public institutions, which is implied in what I said, rule of law cannot be, is not being implemented. But most important, I would put the problems with our political institutions. To me, that is at the root of the problem, because that's, they are the ones who are doing the oversight, who deal with our resources, who bring in the kind of people who make policies, and that is weak, corrupt, abused, then that sends a very strong message all the way through. And that tells you where the, <coughs> where the answers are. I'm not going to go into all these answers <coughs> in this opening presentation, but I would say that what we really need is to look for a transformation on a number of facets or dimensions. And I'm going to state them as follows. From the status quo in the political institutions that we have, what I would to use that term that may be appropriate for somebody who may think it is too strong, predatory political institutions, which are really abusing the power that they have. Take out election funding itself is a classic case. If people who uh, use unaccounted money do not account or audit accounts, no transparency, and you expect them to govern a country with all those qualities, 
So I see a little bit too much of those kinds of people and their institutions. So I'm, I would say transformation is extremely important to move from predatory to more accountable and transparent political institutions. Of course, it happens to be the most complex thing to do, maybe the most difficult, but I am putting it as number one in dealing with corruption, <coughs> those standards, those standards in public life, or in the corporate world too. I'm leaving corporate world because politics impacts on their behavior. And perhaps vice versa, there can be a great deal of pollution in these areas too. Second transformation is from mere passing of laws or legislation to enforcement. How do we change this emphasis? What is wrong with our enforcement? Why is it that we are not able to do things according to the rule of law or the rules that we ourselves are framed and uh, address? Lokpal is a great example. We think by specifying all of those things, the same people now will perform differently. It's a, it's a big question. We need to debate. Will that happen? We don't trust the Prime Minister. We don't trust the leader of the opposition. We think judiciary is corrupt, but the Chief Justice. We put them all together, and then we think, that will work. Of course, there is some merit in having checks and balances, and this could be an example where even if everyone is a thief, when they have to agree upon pollution, may be a little more difficult. There may be some <laughs> But from loss to enforcement, leadership that we need in terms of transformation. Third, from creating a multiplicity of institutions to strengthen each one and to develop the kinds of systems and practices that will enable them to uphold their mission, to perform. Even while having a tea, we were talking about the difficulty in our systems. Very much person-oriented. If I knew X or Y, I can get things done in five minutes. If I didn't know anyone, it can take months or years, but nothing is done. That transformation, it's a question you have raised. I practically, I mean, in the practical terms, I don't really think we can attribute all this to a capitalist system if you look at the Soviet Union, that's one of the most corrupt system. I mean, whatever be the system, if there is scope for pollution and there is non-transparency and we are governed by greed, driven by greed, then these kinds of abuses and corruption will prevail, whether in a corporate setting or in the, in the public life. So I'm saying that all our human institutions are valid. We need to while trying to perfect them, realize that it is by creating internal mechanisms which are robust and strong, that's what we are calling systems, practices, etc., which at least will give a little more teeth and strength to these institutions. You know, in front of our own eyes, we have in Bangalore, we had a very corrupt property tax system. When I came here first, I remember officials coming, they would say how the tax is determined. But they were willing to negotiate, your tax will be this much. But if you do this, we can bring it down. So what is your formula? That is very difficult to explain. It's <laughs> complex and so forth. A couple of years ago, we have now brought in a new system, which is streamlined, which makes use of the technology that is available. And the scope for corruption and opportunities have suddenly declined. It's a great example. It's proven, and we should give much credit to us and others person in that corporation, how a personal leadership can make a difference. He made this happen, obviously, with support from other people. There are many examples of that. Think of transformation from mere creation of institutions without worrying about what is going on. If we have time, I'll just take one, one more example. See, you have heard on TV and channels how citizen charter bills, a bill is going to be passed. Then probably being presented. No one has raised the question, how do you set all those conditions in a charter? Will it happen by law? I know there are thousands of agencies and services in this country. How do you get this done, all those standards to be laid down through an act? Many people have forgotten, but they are not raising this question. First of all, these agencies should do some homework and decide what norms can we implement? What is it that we can actually achieve? You're putting the cart before the horse by simply saying everyone will do this in one week, ten days. How do you know? Who has said that it can be done? That homework is 
that's what uh, it's an example of absence of resistance. That work is not being done, but we think by passing a law, somehow we will force these millions of bureaucrats sitting in various offices to follow those norms. Which should come first? There is a great need, because it's an American institute, and many of you work in the corporate sector, I'm saying, great deal of scope and need to work on these systems using technologies that we have, and that could make a difference in the transformation that I'm talking about. And finally, we need to move, get moving from a culture of cynicism, and saying that particularly because of young people, they are being nurtured in a situation, an environment where we believe nothing can be done, nothing will be achieved. All this is talk. We may pass laws, but there's no value. Just go on. Any visitor seeing the way our traffic moves can draw a conclusion. There are rules about traffic. Who observes? You go visitor that the whatever can be done. Now, if that kind of cynicism persists, many of the things that we are talking about will not be implemented, will not produce an impact in any case. Therefore, particularly thinking about the youth, I want to conclude by saying the transformation that we need is from the culture of cynicism to one of hope. That we can change, that we can do these things. I personally believe this will take time. It will not be done by no party or any of the single act or one point agendas. If you go back to the 18th and 19th century, what we are facing now is what England, European countries, US tend to, even yesterday I was reading a book going over America's founding. The founding fathers were great people, they think about their ideas. But right there from the beginning, 18th century, how much corruption and abuse went on went on there? And how it took them a century or longer to create the new systems, create the awareness, understanding among people, the bureaucracy, the politicians, to change their way strategy. They haven't achieved it, but in many areas they have done better than us, whether it is in transparency, sharing access to information, justice, dealing with the guilty, in all of those things they have done better. So I want to take that model and say, we will be over-optimistic if we think that a few laws that we pass will solve the problem. It takes all these transformations to take place. They are going to take place over a longer period of time because our society itself has many weaknesses that we cannot suddenly correct. So let me stop with these uh, opening remarks and I look forward to a productive interaction. Thank you, Professor Paul, for reminding us about the interconnectedness of all these uh, systems and issues. Uh, Paranjal, you know, you can speak. Thank you, Professor Rishikesh, ladies and gentlemen. It's my honor, my privilege to be here to speak on the subject. Um, I want to focus a little bit go beyond what Professor Samuel Paul said, you know, individual corruption and institutionalized forms of corruption. But before that, a few words on individual corruption. And I do not really know how unique we are in that respect. A man who has no shirt obviously wants one, and when he has one, he wants two. Then he wants 10, then some people want 20. And some of us cannot distinguish between our need and our greed. There will be a museum in Manila for all the shoes that Imelda Marcos had. <laughs> Near her home, uh, Ramanika Raju is understood to have only a thousand pairs of suits. Uh, imagine it could take him about three years, including a few Sundays, to run through each of the pairs of suits. That <laughs> we love to distinguish between the more corrupt and the less corrupt. Between the corrupt and efficient and the corrupt and inefficient. Mr. Saran Das, former director general of the Confederation of Indian Industries, uh, was uh, caught unawares on recorded conversation by Ms. Neera Radia, now in London, complaining about, uh, praising, I beg your pardon, the former union minister for highways, Mr. Kamal Nath. Say he preferred Mr. 15% to his predecessor, Mr. 15%. Mr. Balu, I presume he was referring to. 
when he took uh, because uh, he took a took a fifteen percent. One built the roads on time, the other didn't. Mr. Das subsequently virtually slapped himself on live television in front of Tarun, uh, front of Karam Thapar actually, regretting why he made those silly remarks that he did. But he uttered the home truth. He actually uh, uh, articulated what many of us believe in. You know, we are good, nuanced Hindus, uh, or at least 81% of us are. So we do distinguish between the thief who steals a brinjal and leaves a few behind for the original owner, and the one who plucks out a carrot or a radish from the ground and leaves nothing for the owner. So we've always had a very nuanced and, uh, view of corruption. We've never seen corruption in terms of black and white, but many, many shades of gray. But what's very important is that today, why are we talking about all this? I mean, corruption is as old as the hill, it's older than Kautalya. But why is it, I mean, that we are we really shocked at the sheer scale of corruption and the brazenness? Kali Janathan Reddy is in jail in Hyderabad, as is Mr. Andhuntu Raja. Mr. Karunanidhi said, hello, you know, uh, he's a Dalit, that's why he's being attacked. Dr. Manmohan Singh said, it's the compulsion of coalition politics that made him uh, keep Mr. Raja, make Mr. Raja the Union Communications Minister once again. Uh, when you look at simple arithmetic, you know, we, we can find many, many reasons to justify our action. There are 18 members of parliament belonging to the DNK who are still in the UP. But when Mr. Karunanadi was in power in Chennai, the 34 MLAs belonged to the Congress who were supporting him. So a moot question would be, in terms of very simple arithmetic, who needed whom more? Did Mr. Muthuel Karunanadi need Mr. Manmohan Singh more or vice versa? You know, when elections were taking place in Kara, in Tamil Nadu, people said, you know, Karunanadi's government has performed the PDS system runs the best in Tamil Nadu, healthcare, you know, universalized PDS. And, and we are all again good Indians, you know. So what if you've given this poor little fellow a color television set? You know, he may still end up watching Jaya TV on that color television set. But we distinguish between the more corrupt and the and, and the less corrupt. So for the politics is always a choice between the lesser evil. And we know where Mr. Karunanidhi is now at present. And we know why Ms. Jayalalitha decided to say at least temporarily goodbye to her confidant, Ms. Shashi Kala, and her close relatives. So what we're seeing is actually a very, very unique uh, situation currently prevailing in the country today. Mr. Raja has been accused by none else but the controller of the of India of having caused a presumptive loss to the exchequer, running into an equivalent of about 40 billion US dollars. You know, it's not just one of the biggest scams in this country, it would fall into the category of one of the biggest scams in the world. Uh, it's interesting because Mr. Kapil Sibyl says there was no loss. <laughs> You know, we are really interested because we find these complete binary opposites. You're told that, you know, you get your mobile phones and your phone calls are very cheap and in the city where you live in, there are more mobile phones than human beings. All thanks to, you know, cheap <coughs> stuff being available. But hello, Mr. Raja has been in jail from the 2nd of February. So is Mr. Kalmari. We do had uh, two, three chief ministers behind bars, Mr. Madhu Koda. Mr. Yehudu Rappa also spent a small time there. Uh, we had a former secretary to the government of India, Mr. Siddharth Nehru. And number one, as we mentioned, corporate honchos, big things. <coughs> uh, those three or four individuals who were in the Haji and said, they did what they did. Mr. Anil Amani didn't know what they, what they were doing, of course. <laughs> Mr. Shahid Bala did what he did. Mr. Shahid Pawar didn't know what he was doing. I think it's very important for some of us to mention these names. Because, if we are trying to find what is unique about corruption in India, we can look around us and find people who are even more brazen and even more venal in looting resources that belong to large numbers of people, the people of this country, whether it be telecommunications spectrum or iron ore. But when we look at institutionalized forms of corruption, we have to get down to the basics, the roots of corruption. I mean, this is back in election funding. And this is a subject on which a lot has been written, a lot can be discussed. But the short point is the whole manner in which election campaigns is funded and the rules and the laws that exist in this country, so riddled with loopholes, 
And that's, that is the source. That's the fountainhead of corruption in India. Then it doesn't matter, you know, whether we go back to the scriptures and justify what was said, what whether Ashwatthama was actually a human being or an elephant, or whether we can do what we like, and if Gali Janath is ready to donates a crown to Pirupati, he's cleansed, and you and I can do it, uh, simply go to Hathwa, you can just take a dip in the holy Ganga, and hello, your king is a whistle. Today we are in a situation where the personal integrity of the Prime Minister is never been question. Yet, why is it that everybody is up in arms? Is it because the political opposition on the left, the political opposition on the right, are in a state of disarray? Among other things, because they've been accused of corrupt practices, the CPM in this world, the BJP in this state, and that vacuum in the polity is being filled up to the nature of horse vacuums by proactive sections of the judiciary, the media, and of course civil society. Are we seeing the judiciary being accused of being proactive, of overreaching itself, because we've had very, very serious allegations of corruption being leveled by against at least three former chief justices of India. And let me name them. Justice Balakrishnan, Justice Sabarwal, Justice Anand. Justice Balakrishnan's relatives have been accused of acquiring assets disproportionate to known sources of income. Justice Sabarwal's sons have been accused of being cahoots with a bunch of builders at a time when the Supreme Court of India was sealing properties across the national capital region because commercial, ostensibly because commercial establishments were operating in residential premises. <coughs> and I do not really know Justice Anand's state of birth. And I'm also not sure of the former army chief's state of birth. Leave <laughs> that as it may. The question that is being asked today is whether we are seeing crony capitalism as the other side of economic liberalization which we've seen in the last 20 years. And I have a problem with those who claim that whenever economies grow fast, that corruption, like inflation and inequality, is almost an inevitable consequence of quote-unquote growth and development. The robber barons of the United States of America in the 30s, after the Soviet Union disintegrated, the, the, the oligarchs of Russia, or, or, or the Communist Party leaders in China. I'm very happy to hear today uh, representatives of multinational corporations in India talking from public platforms in Mumbai, <laughs> describing other industrialists in India as oligarchs. I'm delighted, because it's the most appropriate way to define them. <laughs> I mean, here we have a situation in this country where Mr. Mukesh Ambani and his family of four are supposed to be residing in a 22-story building in one of the most expensive pieces of real estate on this planet. But why haven't they moved in there? If the Times of India is to believe, that has something to do with Vastu. Mr. Ratan Tata, after alleging that this is the stuff revolutions are made of, quickly retracted in his statement and said he had been misquoted and quoted out of context. But the short point is, we are seeing today the country's natural resources, and resources that at the end of the day, which are supposed to belong to you and me, are possible. <coughs> yes, the government which is supposed to act as the resources Act as, a, as a genuine custodian of resources that belong to the people of this country, are seen as active players and participants in this entire process. Yes, there's always been a nexus between big business and politics across the globe and also in India. But today, in, for instance, Gali Janathan Reddy, currently behind bars in Hyderabad, we see an individual who epitomizes the nexus between crime, business, and politics. Add to that, some of my friends in the media, thanks to Radia's conversations which are now in the public domain, 
Remember that the Times of India and the Hindustan Times had the Raja conversation at least a month before they were published by Arthur Kenyon. And I'm naming names here. Fact, check it out. I say it with full responsibility. Bennett Goldman Company Limited is free to sue me for criminal defamation. The sad part about corruption in the media, and I'm going to spend a few minutes sir, just talking about corruption in the media, is once again God beyond individual greed. You know, it's very easy to bribe a journalist with a bottle of whiskey. But that's old hat. You know, way back in 1930, there was a very famous uh, author, Humbert Wolf, who wrote a novel called The Uncelestial City, where he has this wonderful ditty, which is very, very appropriate as much as it is for the British journalist, the news of the world kind of journalist, Mr. Rupert Murdoch's employees, and the Indian journalist. He wrote, you can never hope to bribe or twist. Thank God, the British journalist. But seeing what the man will do, unbribed, there's no reason to. <laughs> Mr. Albani described editors as people who were willing to bend when they were, who were willing to crawl when they were asked to bend during the emergency. What we've seen is in India, and, and we, I can talk about this all night if you wish to, the largest organization, the biggest, the market leader, so to say, big brother who should be showing the younger siblings the way, actually showed them the wrong way. So we have media net goes beyond enough publicity to film producers and actors. We have private treaties. You know, we thought treaties were documents signed between governments of nation states. These are treaties, private treaties, signed between advertisers and media companies. Clear conflicts of interest. And then now it's entered the, the domain of politics. So those who stand for elections, you know, they are paying the media to publish favorable stories about them. And also paying the media to publish negative stories about their political opponents. So we have a series of frauds taking place. Not only is your reader, your uh, viewer deceived into believing that what is supposed to be an independently produced news item is actually a paid for advertisement, you are seeing it going beyond that. A candidate standing for elections are violating the model code of conduct, the conduct of election rules. Those receiving the bribe givers, we also in India unique as the Supreme Court of India in the famous JNM case, we did drew a distinguished distinguish between bribe givers and bribe takers. So this indeed are some of the reasons why India is unique. It's the only country in the world with 17 languages on our currency note in case you didn't know that. No, but I think we are also going to be unique in the way in which this society is getting cleaned up. Slowly but surely, the same corrupt media is also on occasions proactive also contributing to transparency in society, the RTI Act. All of these are slowly but surely, we are very gradually, perhaps excruciatingly slowly, moving towards a system where those in positions of power and authority are going to be held increasingly responsible for their actions and their exercise of discretionary power. Because we have a proactive judiciary, because we have a section of the media that's still not corrupt, and because we have large sections of civil society that are willing to go out onto the streets if necessary. So, uh, despite what appears to be a very, very bleak scenario, I would like to believe, ladies and gentlemen, Kali Yuk is here and now. The darkest star is always just before the dawn. So I'm very hopeful that your children and your grandchildren will be living in an India which is less corrupt than the one Thank you so much. Just to give you a context, I have worked in large corporates, 
I've uh, been an entrepreneur, I've built businesses, I've sold businesses. So I come from a very different uh, uh, perspective. Um, I'm, not, uh, I'm not a person to comment on politics, but I can certainly comment on what an individual and perhaps a business can do and should be doing. Firstly, for me, ethics, uh, and I've spent a little time thinking about it, ethics is not just about corruption and integrity. There are a few other angles to uh, ethics which I believe is important for us to spend a few minutes thinking about and um, see how those aspects of ethics also need to be incorporated into the thinking and the way businesses function. For one, for me ethics of course is integrity but also is about doing the best that you can on any occasion. So excellence in what you do is for me a very important definition of ethics which today can, you can find a lot of uh, dilution in that and I'll probably come back and comment on that a little further. Third for me is about how you treat people. One of the large companies that I work for, a company called Tesco, had a very nice uh, phrase for this, treat people the way you like to be treated. And I think that's something which we keep forgetting. Treating people, uh, everybody the same way that you believe you want to be treated in every occasion and that, that translates into things such as uh, diversity, equality, just basic respect for people, uh, harassment of any sort, all of that to me is a very important part of ethics and sometimes in the whole worry about integrity, we forget that you can be high in integrity and very poor in terms of treating people, to me that's poor ethics also, that's a very unethical behavior, because that's not right, that's absolutely against moral standards. So when I look at but just three dimensions, I'm, I'm sure I can pick up many more dimensions. So integrity, excellence and behavior to people, those are three things which I look at as a definition of ethics. Now when I look at how does an individual create his own moral center, to me a lot of that comes from home, from family and a lot comes through education. Right through the school stage, how you get treated, what your... And, Whatever school may say, values, education, etc., etc., they are only watching what people do. Children don't learn by hearing, they hear, learn only by watching. And they watch what the parents do, their behaviors, they watch what the teachers do, what the teachers say, and then what they do. Then they start realizing, hmm, there is, there is a difference. You, know, you can say something and do something, and that's not. So those are, the, those are some of the cues that they start picking up. And I believe that, and when I come back to what needs to be done, I think, and I'm right now in the area of education, school education, I very strongly feel that there is an opportunity to do something there. And of course, as you, as you grow, you get into professional education, you come into hallowed portals or institutes like this. I was one of, one of the fortunate few who came from one such institute, Calcutta. The amount of time that was spent on discussing ethics was uh, very, very minimal. A lot more time spent on think, uh, discussing numbers, how do you get them, profitability, how do you treat people, uh, HR and all of that. But it's really not about, it was more about structures and how you know, uh, performance management should be done. But who said that you, you have to treat people the way you want to be treated? That's not something that you learn in any institution. Didn't learn. I know that a lot of change since then and I know Vasundi here is doing a lot of work in this institution and many other institutions are doing the same. To bring back some of those thoughts in our, uh, in the, in, during the course of professional education. So a lot of conditioning happens there. And then when you're in a business world, there's a lot of external pressures. You start, you, you may have created a great moral compass in the center, but all the different um, uh, uh, environmental pressures that come on you, you need to get business, you need to grow your company, you need to be seen as a profitable company, you need to handle taxes, you need to handle um, uh, various uh, uh, you know, uh, approvals that you have to get. All of that starts to sort of erode some of that moral compass that people create. Now the moral compass doesn't change, but what happens is a lot of layers that you create on top of that. So inside, you're feeling very conflicted. Oh my God, I'm doing the wrong thing, but you probably end up doing that anyway. I mean, business is big, you have to do this, you have to do that, this is what is expected, so on so forth. So all of that starts to work and start to create perhaps that whole uh, shifting of the moral compass. Now just one other thing that I would say is, which is, and none of this is special about India, okay, this happens everywhere I'm sure, but what is another special factor in India which is uh, 
very, um, you know, very affectionately we refer to ourselves as the people who have the jugad in us, right? We are jugadu people. It's very good because you know what jugadu gives is a lot of uh, creativity. It makes us do things when you know everybody has given up. If you've ever been in the U.S. and uh, where there is no concept of jugadu, it's really follow the law and follow the rules. If you've got stuck in an airport, you will know how you get treated. There is a and, uh, there is no support whatsoever here, at least they will make some effort. You know, ma'am, let's do something, you know, don't move on traveling, can we help? No, 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 this is it. The law says, or the mind regulation says okay. that you lady have to spend next two days in the in the airport in some corner, you know, there's no food, that's how it is, you know, I can't help. So, there are some positive parts, parts of our jugad. We use washing machines, uh, we use the washing machines to make lassi, great jugad, all of that we can do. But the negative part of jugad is, what leads to, uh, you know, like getting by, chalta hai, all of that. Because you know, in the last moment, somehow by jugaad we make up. So even if you do not a great job, even if you are, so the excellence bit I was talking about, you can do okay because you know, in the last moment you can cover up. The other aspect of jugaad leads to miss milestones, to say, yeah, yeah, I'll do it, yes to everything. And the third part, and which is the most insidious part of jugaad, is that somehow get things done by doing whatever it takes. You know, the stuff under the table, the things that no one wants to talk about. Just get it done, I don't want to know. So that's the third part of jugaad, which is the one which translates into all of that. So that is that, that, is that very um, you know, affectionate but uh, very strong part of India which leads to this. Now, in terms of the, the current atmosphere, there is a lot of visibility to pointing out and shaming, naming and shaming people who have done wrong things, actually I think is a fantastic opportunity. Why? Because today, anybody whose name gets sullied, is sullied forever. And I'll tell you why, because within a second you're tweeted, you're blogged about, you're in this and that, and that, I can tell you friends, doesn't ever go away. So you have to work really hard, because you can search today, and you can, so your grandchildren will search for you in Google, they will still find a reference about what that translation you did, when you were in your callow twenties and you didn't know any better, you are host. For the rest of your life, everybody knows every bit of your translation doesn't go away. So actually, it's very, very good. It is forcing a degree of transparency that I'm hopeful will bring about a lot of improvement. There is, I do believe that some amount of the, the, the legislation is going to help. And just to, again, coming back from a corporate uh, um, background, I'll tell you that there are, uh, the, uh, the US government has got something called an FCPA, but the UK government has got something called the ABC, Anti-Bribery and Corruption Act. Now this is the most draconian law that I have ever seen. And everybody, all UK uh, FTSE companies or any company incorporated in the UK are quaking their boots. Why? Even if you own one percentage stake in any company, you are responsible for the actions of every individual in that company and their vendors and their partners. So God help you, anywhere down the food chain, anybody does anything corrupt, the directors of that company which owns that one person can be behind bars. So it's really going all the way, 180 degrees extreme, put something very, very draconian, 20 dollars or 20 pounds excess expense claim and you could be behind bars. It's as, as uh, strict and as draconian as that. Now what is that? Since now uh, we sold the Tutor Vista earlier this year to a company called Pearson which is one of the world's largest education company headquartered in the uh, UK. So I know a lot about ABC, I hear every day about ABC and what, what that is doing for us is it's creating a very strong structure within our company. Not that earlier we were corrupt, but we had we had very strong, I mean that's more because of my moral compass or you know my co-promoter's moral compass that we will do the right things. But here we have a legislation and we have a need to follow that legislation and hence a whole bunch of structures, processes, technologies which are now being used to ensure that none of those things can ever happen. A great deal of tightening has gone and that is something which is I think fantastic. Now, it might be just too draconian and really stupid, some of it, but you know what, it may base us up. Suddenly, my entire company is talking about, you know, should we be doing this or not, in a positive way. I mean, of course, it can lead to paralysis, which is my job as a CEO to ensure it doesn't, but at least there is a lot more of uh, uh, awareness, because you know what, some of these are very grave. What is wrong and what is right in some of these things can be very grave. Now, yeah, I shouldn't bribe anybody, that I know I'm not a moron, but is it okay to just 
overlook when I know that my vendor to release something from custom to Spain something, is that okay? Is that all right or is it wrong? Is, is it okay that, you know, I don't remember exactly whether I spent 100 rupees or 150 rupees on a meal, maybe I just put 150 rupees, I don't have a bill, is that right or that's absolutely wrong? There are a lot of small and big gray things. As uh, one of our uh, colleagues from Australia is saying, she, is, uh, she sells uh, books and curriculum to colleges. She says, you know, I bake a bunch of cookies and cakes whenever I go visit them during Christmas. Is that wrong or is that right? So you start to wonder a lot of small things which look like, okay, you know, just something that you would do to please somebody, you know, just to keep the whole conversation going, you start to worry about that also. So, but the awareness that it has created in the corporate environment as a result of that is absolutely fantastic. Now, having said all that, this, the, my personal uh, uh, submission on this is that there are there is a place for activism. There are people who should be uh, espousing the whole removal of corruption and the Anna Hazare and his team. Fantastic! A lot of people are talking about it. But as a corporate or an entrepreneur, what is it that I can do? Hey, I can keep my stable clean. But more importantly, I want to forget about it, and I just want to go build business. For me to do that is because a in the last two companies that are three companies that have created actually have created 30,000 new jobs which weren't there earlier. So in my own way, I'm contributing back to the, uh, the to the growth of the economy, to the improvement of the standards of many people. And I do believe that at least a petty corruption starts to become less important for people as they start their level or their economic situation improves. They're not going to do small things. Right, the big things you need the low pass and you need the big dandas to catch. But at least the small ones by as entrepreneurs, as business people, by keeping our businesses clean, by building great businesses, by showing the world that India, in spite of whatever limitations, is a great place to be in, then some of these things, which other people are doing the other good things. My job is to build the big businesses and make them really successful. I think that makes a huge statement. That And, and you know what is interesting? There are opportunities, there are places in India where you don't have to be hampered and pulled down by the regulatory issues, which then leads to corruption. You stay away from those final issues. Internet business is fantastic. IT business in the last 20 years has been great. Much, much lesser impact of the whole license raj and the, and the regulatory environment. So find the issues, build businesses. In spite of corruption, you show the way that it is possible to succeed by not getting involved in that corrupt milieu. And then the more you do that, the corrupt people or those people who generate this corruption become less powerful. So that's that's my two cents on what I think as uh, in as industry we could do in this way. Thank you. Hi, Lady Munker, may I request you to put on your sociologist hat and put all of this together a little bit? Thank you very much. I'm honored to be here, and even so, even more so because I share the podium with people I've, I've admired for many years. To be next to them on this panel in this institution is indeed a great honor. Thank you very much for asking me over. On the issue of ethics and business, and the topic of the day being unethical Indian, I think I should begin by telling of an experience that I've recently undergone as a member of the Punjab Governance Reforms Commission. And this, of course, harkens back to what the earlier speakers have said. And as they've said, all the important things that need to be said, I have to reshuffle my cars and place them in line with their call. What we did in Punjab was, and it will soon be known, I think, to the rest of the country, hopefully, before long, is that procedures have been simplified made transparent and easy to audit. With Napoleon, I believe, nothing audited, nothing checked, nothing done. So if you're able to check things and audit things, then suppose you have made quite a big stick, quite a big step towards being an ethical citizen, an ethical corporate person. There are many issues that have been raised today so far, and all of them deserve great degree of attention and discussion. For example, why is it that in India we have this constant struggle with uh, corruption, 
why is it we don't read corruption as Dr. Dr. Simon Paul said, 